ऐसे इंटायरली to introduce this webinar which is one of the series from the toxicology networks and definitely arsenophosphorus poisoning is still a very common problem for us a lot of things are changing some evidence are changing some new model uh, in fact poisoning effect is changing initially which was a purely a neuromuscular poisoning now uh, the new compound has more effect on cns and uh, initially patient comes with the complication like convulsion and sudden cardiac arrest is very common in any phase if convulsion is not being controlled so i hope that today's panel discussion is going to add a lot to your understanding about agnophosphate poisoning and my request dr pl gautam had us to start the program thank you so good evening all uh before i hand over to dr gautam uh, i'll just introduce uh, uh, the iscm toxicology survey which is being held under the guidance of uh, iscm and this network is uh, uh, working to get the data from the uh, our own population and practices and uh, we'll try to come out with the best practice uh, guidelines for our country so the link can be found on isccm website and when we go to the website isccm.org under the research uh, there would found isccm national toxicology survey uh, and when we open the survey we get the form to submit our patients which we have and uh, to bring the awareness and spread the knowledge isccm has supported us to have toxicology webinar series and today we are having the second webinar uh of the series which is on organophosphorus poisoning and uh, for that we thank isccm especially dr rajesh chand mishra president isccm and for today's uh, webinar we have dr parshottam lal gautam as moderator who is professor and head department of critical care medicine dayanand medical college and hospital ludhiana punjab over to you sir thank you dr prashant uh... we have a very eminent uh, speakers uh, panelists with us uh, on this topic first of all thank uh, dr mishra and dr rumta for giving this opportunity to moderate this session which is very important uh, everyone us, of us is dealing with these patients uh, every corner of the country so we have uh, dr professor ashish palla professor internal medicine and in charge emergency medicine from pgi chandigarh he has vast experience uh, in managing that um, opc and other poisonings then we dr josh akokonant to join us we have dr susurta uh, bandopadhyay uh, he is a director amani hospitals salt lake kolkata he will be joining with us then we have dr prasad uh, rajhans chief intensive dinanath mgekar hospital sa center and then we have uh, Dr. Kriti Stish Pawar, critical care and pain physician, eminent researcher from Baramati, uh, Pune. She has done a lot of work on uh, OPC. We have Dr. Prashant Kumar, professor, Department of Nursery and Intensive Care, my uh, very close friend. Uh, now, starting with the, uh, I'll start. We have Dr. Devan Janeja also, Dr. Rumta also, and Dr. Riti Ayer also uh, on the screen. we know that opc is almost uh, everywhere especially the asian countries pesticide poisoning is like anything we get almost uh, 3 million cases and 3 lakh deaths the case fatality is variable starting from 2 to 5% to going up to 25% but on average quite high uh, this but more of problem is in developing countries we have the regional differences both in north versus south because in north we are getting more often our alphas also but we do get good number of patients of opc but in south still uh, opc poisoning is very common uh, we have lot of uh, more than 100 compounds uh, every time it's changing but we know it's very lipid soluble the key feature the opc inactivates uh, acetylcholine states by phosphorylating the serine hydroxyl group on the enzymes so leading to more of acetylcholine available at the nicotinic and muscarinic receptors to start with what we are going to discuss uh, for all panelists uh, 
diagnosis, the issues in the diagnosis and management related controversies. What is a toxidrome? We are going to end all presentations. Then we will be covering a little bit of what is the workup required and uh, the role of pseudocholinesterase and uh, RBC cholinesterase. Then what are the risk, high risk candidates for the risk factors? Then how can we prognosticate? Then what are the treatment targets? Like uh, there are a couple of uh, things like whether to go with the intubation, airway control first or decontamination, arm controversies, then uh, intubation, it can safely lead to a lot of complications. Uh, and what are the complications like early and then like Dr. Mishra told, a lot of uh, these days, uh, new compounds are coming up and we are getting odd presentation like certain cardiac arrests also. Then a little bit of medical legal aspects also. Many of the patients have the substance abuse because of suicide is one of the main reasons for these things. To start with, I will discuss one case and uh, ongoing, then we will discuss the questions related with that. So there is one patient, 45 year old male, which is transferred from other hospital with the diagnosis of acute gastroenteritis. And with the ultrasound sermon, he was admitted there for pain abdomen for the last two days, and he had a loose tools for the last three months because he is a known case of jejunal diverticulum with the on and off abdominal complaints. Vitals at the time of admission to our hospitals were pulse rate 60, regular, VP 160 by 90, temperature a little bit uh, hypothermic, gasping with the 68% saturation, lot of oral secretion and frothing and cold sweating, whole body sweating, and pupils are pinpoint, lot of crepes, abdomen is soft tender, but as per the history a little bit, uh, there is a decrease, you do not put for the 24 hours and the stools are uh, less of mucus. Now, I'll start with Dr. Ashish Balawani. Sir, what is the common presentation in your experience and what's a typical uh, toxidrome of acute OPC pining uh, in your uh, setup? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Purushottam, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, now, this would be a very, very unusual presentation, what you are describing here. Uh, patient getting admitted with acute gastroenteritis. Now, uh, either uh, a lot of things have been missed at the at the place where he was admitted, or there could be a mixture of two or three agents. What we see most of the times is that a person who has consumed OPC would come to you with vomiting, would have diarrhea, would have excessive salivation and would have bradycardia, as you already have mentioned here. Some of them uh, have presented to us with hypotension because of cardiac involvement or maybe excessive vomiting. And some of them do also present with severe metabolic uh, acidosis. And it's not related to possibly the, uh, the OPC, but possibly due to the uh, solvent which is being used and some of these Chinese uh, pesticides which were available in Indian market did cause up very severe metabolic acidosis. So that's the kind of presentation you have. Some of them present in uh, respiratory distress. Uh, seizures are, are typically uncommon. They are most more commonly seen with organochlorine poisonings rather than organophosphate. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, if you go with the typical, Dr. Uh, Balla, if you go with the typical toxidrome, if you have to convey just a message for the participants, so what should they? Yeah, should... it just, you know, initially, it is all the secretions are increased. Every secretion from every part of the body, ex excessive salivation, excessive lacrimation, uh, uh, you know, vomiting, diarrhea. You may have excessive sweating. Uh, maybe uh, having bradycardia, hypotension uh, would be there. And then you would have uh, a paralysis of the muscles. You would have weakness of the muscles and you would at times may have even fasciculations, which would be seen. Thank you, sir. And uh, Dr. Prasad, uh, what are your opinion about uh, these, uh, how frequently you get uh, that sort of case, like odd presentations uh, in these patients? Uh, and how commonly you miss the diagnosis in the initial phase? Uh, Dr. Prasad? Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Yeah. So what was your question? So like, this is a case where we have very got very little unusual case. So yes. how commonly 
you get the, like Dr. Palla told that we get the to typical toxidome like uh, what we call at times a sludge dump. So what is your I mean, uh, take on uh, these patients at times uh, or presentation? Oh, how common? You, you know, yeah. How common you miss the diagnosis in the initial uh, I mean, workup? Clinical. I mean, if it is a very clear-cut case of OP poisoning, particularly a severe organophosphorus uh, poisoning, then uh, usually one, should, one would not miss it. But if you categorize it to mild, moderate, and severe category, then the mild category, particularly a small dose just to threaten the relatives or something like that, if somebody has taken, then that could be missed as a other, uh, like gastroenteritis and other symptoms could be there. But typically, otherwise, usually what we have seen, fortunately for us, the, nowadays, the less number of cases are coming to um, bigger centers and because in periphery, they are being managed well. And very often we also have relatives coming with the bottle or the water compound has been consumed by the person. So in that way, I think the diagnosis, uh, the sludge, typically the cholinergic uh, toxidrome, what we call as, the typical symptoms of the sludge, what we call, they are very common and it is easy to identify. Uh, Dr. Susarato, I mean, he is there. Dr. Bandha, what is your I mean, uh, this thing, uh, presentation that we got like this patient and uh, how common you get odd presentations in your setup uh, OPC? The odd means uh, basically, as you can see, the presentations can be due to muscarinic effects and can be because of nicotinic effects. Muscarinic effects, uh, we recognize well because with the small pupils, this excessive secretions, but the nicotinic, if they take the upper hand, if the patient comes with just convulsions, and you, in a convulsing patient, you miss to uh, see the other signs of frothing, etc., then you might miss it. And if the relatives, they don't give the history or the bottle is not available. In that case, you might be mistaking it for something else. But uh, as you can sometimes do is that if you're in a doubt, you can give a small dose of atropine. And if you see that the secretions were going down, etc., pulse is getting up. So in that case, you might be confirmed that it's an organ of phosphorus poisoning. Thank you. Uh, now, sometimes, uh, if uh, like Dr. Jose is there, no. So, Dr. Susan, you can take up this question. Uh, what workup is required in uh, these cases in evaluation, the initial phase, uh, and what is the role of cholestase and its, uh, 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 RBC and uh, plasma cholestase? Can you take up this question? Uh, routinely, we do not have this, uh, I mean, we do not send this plasma cold stress level. Basically, the role comes when the patient initially, if you have got the bottle, if you have got the uh, typical syndromes, you start treatment, that's fine. Sometimes it might be that when the patient gets uh, what we call into a chronic phase intermediate syndrome or chronic, uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, prolonged after two, three days, you go on having symptoms. In that case, you might be requiring to uh, this uh, get this done because routinely we don't get this in our lab. We need to send it outside to get it done. So that is how the cold storage uh, report uh, is. Role of cold storage machine report is used. Uh, Dr. Ashish Balla, Professor Sir. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are two points which I wanted to uh, mention here. One, that you should not trust if the patient brings a particular bottle to you, because many a times these farmers have larger containers of pesticide and they use smaller containers of any kind to store these uh, uh, in smaller amounts and uh, take them uh, for use. So you may have a container of one kind and the compound may be entirely different. That's that's point number one. Very true. Uh, that is that is that is more likely to cause more confusion. Second is, if you have a typical toxidrome, you don't need any test. You don't need any confirmation. The reason for that is pseudocholinesterase is unreliable. Again, not done. Most of the times, these patients are farmers. We don't even know what is their baseline pseudocholinesterase level. So we we cannot. We cannot rely on these levels. RBC cholinesterase, we don't do uh, it. Very few centers, we've done just one study on RBC cholinesterase. And we found that the turnaround time was so much that it loses its utility. So if you're getting a report after 24 hours, there's no point. So you start treating if you find typical toxidrome. 
and uh, you these these tests actually uh, to my mind have no role at all that's very true uh, dr kirti is uh, there hello hello dr kirti you yeah. are this thing uh, college stays levels uh, and it's uh, your take on i agree with uh, dr palla but uh, i think if we do the serial measurement of choline stress levels which is pseudo choline stress level which is available in the most of the setups if there is a 50% reduction in the initial choline stress level and after 24 hours then uh, the diagnosis is very much confirmed thank you so i go to dr prasad again uh, dr prasad what is your protocol for these patients who are uh, like this patient having a 68% saturation and frothing and respiratory failure so how do you even plan the treatment what are your uh, urgent and immediate steps you take and what are your treatment targets uh, then uh, taking and uh, do we need all patient to icu admission or if it's less than that this all mild cases do you keep the patient in emergency and send them them back so what are your uh, uh, protocol uh, and you are to advise the protocol to others see basically uh, we classify them as mild moderate and severe now what you have given here is if it's a severe category of a patient then primarily we are worried about the bradycardia and hypoxia now there is always a debate whether we should go for early decontamination or whether we should go for the airway but i think oxygenation becomes more important and uh, there is always a chance that while putting the uh, uh, nasogastric tube there could be msis so i think airway securing the airway and uh, of course giving the atropine initially to uh, deal with the bradycardia becomes very important and most of these patients with severe organophosphorus poisoning will land up in the icu the uh, the whether to do the decontamination with km4 or whether to do the decontamination or give activated charcoal that's another point of discussion usually we give the activated charcoal and other, otherwise we uh, do the decontamination uh, with normal cell <clears throat> most of the patients have uh, diarrhea and they have uh, vomiting uh, to start the abdominal lot of uh, peristalsis movements taking the drug away so the role of uh, the thing uh, become always questionable uh, dr prashant uh, can you just because this is a very important aspect uh, taking care of uh, respiratory failure the issues many times happen is these patients who are uh, having hypoxia at the same time a uh, lot of issues are coming with the arrhythmias also so how do you come and manage this because many of the complications happen during uh, these phases only because it's very difficult at times uh, people are expert are not there to intubate and uh, take on these patients uh, airway control and the ventilation how do you go and uh, do it and how do you advise some in now what is your take on yeah. this yeah thank you uh, very important uh, aspect and uh, i think most of it uh, um, will be taken uh, from the from where the uh, other panelists have uh, already talked about and it's about the presentation of the patient as uh, uh, you already mentioned the patient even if it is a atypical one which we have here uh, we see that the patient is having pinpoint pupil patient is gasping there are oral secretions frothing cold sweating lot of sweating is there so now uh, any patient coming to casualty with any kind of these presentations we'll have to uh, look at the abc of the patient and when we look at the abc air we air we will take the priority now the, then the question comes if we are suspecting a op poisoning then the first thing comes to us is our own protection so all all precautions have to be taken in, in terms of personal protective equipments to be used uh, and patient should be planned for decontamination because whatever amount is sitting there either on the clothes or his skin or the patient is uh, breathing out vomiting out those secretion uh, everything is a, a hazard for the healthcare workers now one thing is that the personal protective equipment should be adequately taken all the measures should be adequately taken by all the healthcare workers in the casualty while dealing any of these patients who are coming and at the same time this patient is presenting with a, a gasping with spo2 68% so my priority will come again on the airway now in airway this patient definitely needs intubation because three things there is hypoxia which can be because of uh, bronchospasm or bronchorrhea going on 
there as well as there can be uh, uh, other patients where it can present with the seizures or altered sensorium for which the airway becomes again the priority in all these situations i need to secure the airway at the same time i would require some uh, uh, sedation to the patient benzodiazepines remain good but at the same time, we need to look for the uh, cardiac stability also for these patients. They can collapse even, the, even uh, with some amount of sedation being given. The only important thing looking for the, from the drug aspect, apart from other stabilizing me measures, is using the atropine. And second is avoiding a succinylcholine. Now, succinylcholine, very simple reason, but uh, uh, the trainees which are joining us to remember that it is also degraded by acetylcholinesterase. And, and that is the problem in with OP poisoning patients. So avoiding succinylcholine, using some sedation and airway uh, securing takes the priority. Uh, Dr. Balla wants to add, I think. Sir, please. Yeah, uh, I just, uh, Prashant, what you said is uh, very, very true. Uh, but here uh, the question comes, what kind of personal protective equipment? You know, at the most, if you're wearing a gown and if you are wearing a pair of gloves, what gloves? Latex is not recommended. So it has to be a nitrile glove. So, but the problem is that nitrile gloves are not available in most of the centers. So what do you do in such a situation? You can wear maybe two pairs of latex gloves. That is one way, but then latex is not what is commonly recommended. Second thing, what you said is entirely true. I always have this debate with my colleagues in the Western countries. I would ha rather have a contaminated live patient with tube in, in the ICU, rather than a clean dead body lying in the uh, triage area. So that, that is my take on decontamination versus airway protection. The third thing, which is which is uh, very very uh, uh, important, uh, is uh, uh, the fact that do you want to uh, start treatment first, or do you want to shift the patient to the ICU? My take on this is that since toxicology uh, uh, or the overdoses are there mostly seen in younger patients who are in their productive years of life. So it is very rewarding to treat these patients. My take on toxicology is all the patients of poisoning should be in ICU at whatever stage they are. They may not be having a respiratory distress now, but they may go on to develop respiratory distress. So that's probably my take. It may not be, everyone may not agree with this, but I think good supportive care good intensive care is what these patients need. I fully agree with you, Dr. Palladi. This is the key, actually. Uh, most of the patients may not uh, show the signs initially, but because each and every uh, product is different, patient and interaction patients' own receptors are different. We are not all same. So interaction of patient, even the distribution of receptors in each and every person is different. Some patients may be having a different uh, nicotine, more nicotine receptor. Some may be having more muscarin receptors. And maybe the uh, even the ingestion is there. Sometimes the gut movement is not there immediately. The amount product is there. So interaction of these compounds and uh, the receptor is uh, different for each and every individual. And ICU is the best place to. And another thing is like whether we should give atropine first, oxygenation first, or intubation first. These are very important uh, way uh, where because we want the patient to be alive and uh, we have to prioritize the treatment uh, uh, protocol in that cases because airway control with oxygenation, first maybe with the oxygenation only, even the atropine because these patients are so much uh, prone to arrhythmias and the rest after intubation. That's very important. Dr. Uh, Bandhupadhyay, you want to add something on this point? Can you unmute yourself? Dr. Bandhupadhyay, can you unmute? Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry, I have done it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, I see yeah. these patients once they reach the ICU. It is not my decision, basically. But I think most of the positive patients are sent to the ICU anyway. And in uh, uh, my hospital, although we are right now, maybe for the last two, three years, we are seeing much less organophosphorus. I do not know the reason. Previously, we used to get the 
uh, quite a few in the year, maybe four, five, six a year. But now we are seeing much less than that. But any orthophosphorus present who requires an admission is usually sent to the ICU. And uh, sometimes, definitely, as I pointed out, it can be unpredictable. Initially, the patient who has received atropine is fine. Suddenly, the atropine effects wears off, and the patient suddenly goes into fluorid pulmonary edema with bradycardia. And if you are not vigilant enough, you might lose the patient at that point of time. So, no use playing this patient about these patients in the ward, keeping them in the ward, and waiting for the catastrophe to happen. Uh, yes, Dr. Kirti, you want to add something uh, to this uh, emergency uh, management of early management of these patients? Dr. Kirti? Okay. Unmute yourself, Dr. Kirti. Yeah. I think we, uh, one should follow the international guidelines for this. And the international guidelines says that first is the oxygenation, then atropine then decontamination, then pralidoxine, and then uh, gastric lavage. So in this way, we should go for the initial resuscitation maneuvers. So Dr. Pandu Pate, add something? Yeah. Yes, anything? Yeah. Regarding this patient, um, uh, I mean, most of the patients will definitely, as Dr. Bhalla rightly pointed out, they will go to the ICU. But depending on the capabilities of the respective hospitals emergency department, like now we have got this department of emergency medicine with all the DNB residents and emergency medicine program. I think the initial uh, intubation, atropinization, even uh, to the extent that we can start the PAM also there and all stabilization can happen in the emergency department and then the patient can be shifted to the ICU yeah. for further observation and management. So I think one has to rely on the your own uh, capability of your own emergency department. Fortunately for us here in our hospital, our emergency department uh, ha has all the capabilities of doing the initial resuscitation and stabilization of the patient. That's true. That's true. It's not the uh, more important is the, what the service you are having uh, available in the emergency. If the emergency is too much geared up, there is a program, a teaching program also, and the consultants are available because these are uh, difficult patients uh, to start with. Early phase is very important. So wheresoever the patient is there, if you can provide the services in the emergency, it's good. If you don't have the services that much in the IC, the only thing is we should, what has to is, Patient, many patients come to the PSC and the civil hospitals uh, where the cat thumped, that services are not available. Those are the patients we should shift the right time to the places where the patient can be managed. So that was the reason that rather than sometimes patient uh, come with the mild symptoms, sending back to home is not a good. That was a, a purpose uh, to put this question. So this question is already, uh, we have discussed uh, that uh, decontamination versus air control, which is very important that these patients are at risk of for edemias and having, uh, during your intubation attempts uh, rests also because these patients are having a lot of uh, hypovolemia also because of the sweating. This is, this is a time when the patient just after intubation may go into cardiac rest. So... <clears throat> Dr. Bhalla wants to add something. Dr. Yes, Bhalla. Dr. Bhalla. Yeah, uh, sir, uh, uh, with all due respect, uh, Emergencies, if it is capable, fine. Even in the busy emergency, you should keep these patients in a place where they can be observed. They can be monitored. That, that was the reason. Why, if you have a, a high dependency unit attached to your emergency, shift the patient there. If you do not have a high dependency unit attached to your emergency, then you shift these patients to the ICU, ICU. on priority because these patients have a chance of deteriorating. Cerebral patient. He is a cerebral patient. Because outcome is really very good, very rewarding, these patients. It's just a matter of one or two days, then the things are quite easy later on. Uh, so, uh, already Dr. Prashant has told that uh, depending on the availability, midazolam and uh, giving uh, rocronium or any other non dipolene succinyl choline has the problem. Uh, so, Dr. Prashant, uh, what is the, I mean, uh, once the patient are intubated uh, with any of the non deep or like, like we use a lot of atomidate and rocodium to intubate these patients, but depending on the availability, if the metazolam is there, that is a wonderful drug for these patients because these patients are at risk of seizures. It works in both ways, uh, handling these patients. What was the ICU sedation in these patients once they are intubated? Because they are quite restless and they fight with the ventilators. So what sort of, uh, 
ventilation and uh, the sedation to carry on in ICU. For these patients, what we practically uh, practice is uh, uh, infusion of midazolam and fentanyl. And uh, uh, as you said, that these patients are quite restless and uh, they have the twitching movements as well. And they also lead up to seizures if they are leading into the severe category. So um, if uh, uh, we are unable to get a good control with midazolam and fentanyl and hemodynamics are okay, then... Uh, uh, we also add propofol uh, sometimes. Dexmeditomidine uh, is a good drug we use for other patients, but with OP, uh, there always remains a problem with the Brady. These patients are already in Brady, and on one hand, uh, they are receiving atropine. So uh, Dexmed in our practice is uh, uh, not routinely used. What about ketamine combination of midazolam, ketamine, and propofol, uh, these patients? Uh, that 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 is being discussed nowadays and used, but uh, in our practice, are not using ketamine. Uh, ketamine. Uh, anyone uh, wants to uh, add on this? Yeah. Thing? Ketamine. No. Can I add something to the sedation? Please, yes, please, sir. please. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, basically, you see, in the in the initial years when we used to use less uh, lower dose of of uh, uh, two pam or a little time. P patients used to be over atropinized and their heart rates used to remain 140, 150 like that and fully dilated pupil. But now we don't target for fully dilated pupil, but we target a heart rate of say 100, uh, 80 to 100 or 110. So it's very important that uh, because over atropinization has its own problems like it will, uh, the atropine will cross the blood brain barrier and it will uh, cause uh, fever, it will cause uh, already there is humidity around. And the irritability and to extend some convulsions also sometimes. So what is more important is to balance dose of atropine with adequate sedation and pralidoxime uh, so that you don't over atropinize the patient and also if the consistently if the patient's heart is pumping at the heart rate of 140 then there's a, always a heart failure chance is there. Of course most of these hearts are young but what is important is to balance medazola, pralidoxime and atropinization. That is why sedation becomes extremely important and the patient, if he's over atropinized, there is always chance of self extubation. In these patients, we have seen a lot of uh, patients can also self extubate. So, sedation becomes very, very important. Yes, uh, but we are using ketamine also because it has a one benefit because it's uh, working on the NMD receptors, which is a very uh, patient who, especially the seizure activity, if you combine with the propofol or midas, uh, this works very well. Desomodine is also not, it's a very, uh, in these patients, not a good drug because. Patients are hypovolemic, they are at the risk of bradycardia, so not a very good drug. But fentanyl also has a problem because it leads to, um, although it's a good drug, but gut motility is at times affected, uh, that's a concern. So, if there is any shortage of atropine, sometimes because patients need a lot of, especially at the periphery, can we have the other alternatives uh, and uh, those things? Dr. Kirti, can you comment on this uh, question? <laughs> I think there is no alternative for atropine. Atropine has to be there, but if in the absence of atropine, you can use the glycoparlate, but that will control the secretions, not the bradycardia. Uh, Dr. Bala, you want to comment on this thing? Uh... And can I add uh, something? Yes, uh, yes yeah, please. Dr. Kirti, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and we have treated few cases without atropine because we have given the adequate doses of pralidoxine. And the basic difference is that atropine is the only anti-muscarinic agent and the pralidoxine is the reactivator of the acetylcholine stress. So it takes care of muscarinic, nicotinic and CNS actions. And one more point I want to add, the seizures are very, very uncommon in organophosphorus poisoning. So uh, I think there is a no uh, much role of sedation if you give the adequate doses of atropine and judicious use of pralidoxime, patient is never irritable in the ICU nowadays. The days are gone when the patient was constrained and uh, tied to the beds and sedation was required. So I want to add that. So uh, as far as yeah. glycoparlate is concerned, that doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. Uh, so whatsoever the nicotinic receptors, uh, acetylcholine is there in the brain. Uh, that, uh, can I, can I come in, sir? Yes, Dr. Balla, you can... Uh... Yeah. See, atropine is a life-saving drug. It is available everywhere. Yes. Glycoparlate is not a life-saving drug. May not be available everywhere. 
glycopadlet is more expensive than atropine so if you want if you want to buy glycopadlet buy atropine it's cheaper it is simpler it, we've had more experience with atropine but uh, uh, i tend to differ a little bit with dr kirti pawar here atropine is the only drug i i repeat here atropine is the only drug which has shown to make a survivor benefit in organophosphate poisoning the data about pam is controversial i know she is there so we may be having a little bit of a debate here on uh, pam or uh, no pam but i don't think there is any going away from atropine the the idea of giving atropine is that you have to rapidly dry the secretion so there comes the role of doubling dose or increasing the infusion every couple of minutes controlled in a controlled way so that the patient does not go on to develop the uh, cns toxicity of atropine or the side effects and has a dry lung and a warm skin i think that uh, dr prashotam dr yes, prashotam may i come in this is dr yes, sir Ruta. please sir please sir please sir right so i i was uh, triggered to come in usually i would not come in <laughs> in such debates but i am afraid i won't agree with dr kirti on uh, effect of uh, glycopyrrolate on heart rate it increases the heart rate to the same tune as atropine does so there is no difference of effect of either atropine or glycopyrrolate on heart i have a article right in front of me on my computer which says the effect of glycopyrrolate and atropine on heart rate are comparable therefore we may not be confused about effect of atropine or glycopyrrolate parallelly only when we have toxicity of atropine on cns then glycopyrrolate will come in picture and if glycopyrrolate was not to have any effect on heart rate it would become a redundant antidote and glycopyrrolate is used in absence of atropine therefore this was the only thing i wanted to say that glycopyrrolate has almost equivalent effect on heart rate as does atropine therefore there is no fear of bradycardia with glycopyrrolate in and when you have serious atropine induced toxicity particularly convulsions in patients of uh, atrop uh, this op poisoning then glycopyrrolate is definitely drug of choice antidote of choice and it would not be of any use if it was not to have any effect on heart rate that was what i wanted to say thank, uh, thank you. you dr thank you for that's very uh, yes uh, that's very true even we use glycopyrrolate only when because it is doesn't cross the blood brain barrier yeah. uh, as far as the regulatory effect is concerned glycopyrrolate is really very good especially the secretions it's a wonderful drug uh, now this patient uh, we got the investigation done also like hemoglobin tlc platelets random blood sugar uh, serum creatinine and, and uh, pct patients the uh, toxicology screening was also done patients opiate levels was a little high when it was so dr balla so what is your take on i mean this uh, i will start from you uh, like patients rbs is high creatinine is high i mean uh, and pct is also high so what about uh, uh, these things in this patient uh, so many patients oh. hemoglobin high could be uh, hemo concentration the patient may be uh, vomiting may be dehydrated may be having uh, you know this something which we very commonly see tlc high again uh, random blood sugar high in these patients could be a reactionary stress uh, uh, hyperglycemia what we have seen uh, uh, in other patients also is that people who are chronic alcohol consumer have some amount of chronic pancreatic uh, chronic pancreas insufficiency so whenever they go into uh, developing uh, 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 any kind of stress they manifest with stress induced hyperglycemia so creatinine high hemoglobin high just tells me that there could be hemoconcentration 
PCT of 14, well, if, uh, uh, if, you, if you actually take it on face value, PCT has no role even in the diagnosis of sepsis. Uh, anyway, all PCT is uh, known to uh, kind of give you is the fact that uh, when, you, when your PCT is coming down, you can, uh, you know, de-escalate your antibiotics. I would probably not start uh, antibiotics based on PCT. And in patients with renal uh, dysfunction, your CRP, your PCT may be higher. This patient could also be having diarrhea if he was a chronic opioid user and is in withdrawal. So that's also another thing which you would need to take uh, into uh, consideration. Consideration. So other panelists, uh, Dr. Bandopadhyay, your uh, take on this, uh, you agree with Dr. Balla or any uh, want to add thing? I generally agree. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Anyone else want to have a comment on this? Okay. So, as far as hyperglycemia is concerned, more, many of the patients uh, react to hyperglycemia because as such also, organophosphosporins, uh, these patients, uh, because of uh, effect on the adrenals, uh, because of uh, this, the pathways are there, which helps in more of uh, cholinergic, uh, um, uh, this post ganglion on the adrenal uh, autonomic ganglia and including the adrenal medulla. They are in hyperglycemia many times, uh, so we should not take on this thing uh, that this is. So I fully agree with Dr. Balla. Normally, antibiotics are not required for OPC patients uh, because they have bad x-rays, but even then, it's not the infection. So we have cut a lot of possibilities in this patient uh, because the uh, patient came from outside, but we treated like uh, OPC in this patient, and the cholinesterase stress levels were uh, low. So now, coming with the atoporization uh, protocol, and uh, we have already discussed the goal of treatment that we want, uh, Dr. Palla very nicely and other panelists told, that we want the lungs to be dry. That is the key. And not like uh, the previous one, we go with the heart rate of this, temperature of this, and uh, going with super dilatation. So, Dr. Bandhapadha, what is the atropization protocol you follow? And you want to, although Dr. Palla has already uh, commented on this. So, in a sick we, patient like this, so how you go for we, we, we go for inter intermittent doses normally, unless the patient is very seriously ill, and when we use even an infusion. Basic idea has already uh, cleared enough. That is, the idea is to keep the patient dry. And we also want the heart rate to be something around 80. We don't want a very bradycardic patient. That is what we follow. That we either, uh, I tell my residents to watch whether the patient is having increased secretions or not. And if the patient is having a heart rate uh, around 80 or not. That is our target. We don't want tachycardia. We don't want mitriasis. I think there are some trials in serious patients that if you uh, I mean, uh, uh, from, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, upfront you use a higher dose of atropine, increasing dose with the infusion, they might be having better results. But I don't know. I only use infusions in very serious patients where, even with intermittent doses, you are having lots of secretions or uh, bradycardia. And Dr. Prasad, uh, you want to add on this atropination protocol? Because this is the key drug in uh, these patients. No, I think in general I agree with the what. Uh, Dr. Susuta said, atropine initially we can give the bolus dose and then if, if, it is, uh, if you require more, then you can always double the dose and later on you can go for the infusion. Dr. Balla, again, uh, palm controversy has been there and uh, you have always uh, against the palm. So I want your comment on this uh, again, uh, about the palm, using the palm in these patients. Uh, Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, this is this is my last comment. I, I think I have to go now. Uh, this is my last comment. Uh, uh, my uh, comment is very clear. Uh, there are only two studies which have, or, or there is only one study which has shown some uh, benefit. That is Dr. Keithy's study. But the dose used was very different from what has been recommended in WHO guidelines. She used a very high dose. And the second thing, which was very, very important uh, from her study was that most of the patients, uh, or nearly 60% of the patients were ventilated. They came in early and they were started on high dose, two grams IV bolus of PAM and one gram every hourly. 
for next 48 hours now if you if you do not get the patients early in the course of illness if you get them beyond 6 hours it becomes very difficult uh, to assess the effect of pam in them second is the study by uh, michael edelston and uh, uh, horst thiemann had done the rbc cholinesterase level in germany and i think kirti knows uh, horst uh, well she's visited his center as well as i did so he is of the opinion that and the paper had clearly mentioned that even if you show rbc acetyl cholinesterase regeneration it does not translate into mortality benefit so i think what saved dr kirti pawar's patients was timely and good supportive therapy in the form of ventilation and uh, pam i would keep my uh, views reserved i don't i don't trust pam i think uh, i mean we have already discussed to pam also so most of dr rungta and uh, already said that i think many of us will uh, agree on this thing also uh dr kirti want to add on something uh, this thing yeah we have to discuss uh, it more because we are left with the 15 minutes i want to discuss more on the uh, weaning and extubation failures also uh, just one minute uh, for this controversy we can discuss more yeah the recent guidelines are suggesting that the, if you need a doubling doses of atropine and if there is a neuromuscular weakness you should trust upon the pralidomycin as a nicotinic antidote and it should be continued till the atropine requirement is stop and patient is off the ventilator about the who guideline the the doses we have used are similar and little more than that and we are in the therapeutic range of pralidoxin so need not to say again and again these are the very high doses because these are the actual doses uh, at which the uh, stent cholinesterase can be regenerated so in literature there are literally four clinical trials two from 1990s which are conducted inadequate doses of pam for inadequate period the third clinical trial is with uh, from us that is baramati trial which used the doses similar to the who regime and the fourth clinical trial is conducted by professor elinston in sri lanka which used the similar doses but without any uh, respiratory support because they were lacking in the supportive care so my stay my say in this is the if you are managing neuroparalytic snake bite the oxygenation and ventilator is must similarly if you are talking about the carried out point you should have the supportive care which can intubate and ventilate the patient and if somebody has conducted the trial without this supportive care i don't rely upon that and that's why the recent guidelines are clearly mentioned there is a there is a need to understand how much palm we should give for diethyl and dimethyl uh, uh, this thing organophosphates in that uh, thank you dr kirti thank you uh, i think we have taken this point because it's a very important point the main problem comes uh, with the, i want to be waiting much on this uh, the aging process of the cause all the uh, products compounds opc have the different aging points some of the previous which were used for the wars they can just go with the aging in 2 3 minutes where the palm will not act so most of our patients say they come quite late to the hospitals that comes really difficult but atropine and supportive therapy remains a key especially the ventilation uh, now going to the next uh, because uh, we can do the doubling dose every 5 minutes uh, 3 to 5 minutes so that's the key so now coming this patient improved uh, as far as the aki was concerned we tried the weaning in this patient and uh, using uh, different um, lung mechanics and clinical judgments but patient's uh, cholinesterase levels also improved but this patient uh, had a uh, failure of rising the doctor susat and dr prashant what is your take on uh, first i'll go to dr bandopadhyay so it failure of into extubation in this patient how will you I mean, uh, manage this patient uh, and what about the intermediate syndrome in this patient basically yeah some of these patients uh, i'm mean, uh, de depending on the series is 10% or sometimes even high 30% patients they go into this sort of uh, intermediate syndrome particularly with those which are highly fat soluble those are the main culprits so in that case you may have to left to be patient for several weeks maybe the typical signs of uh, this uh, intermediate syndrome are proximal muscle weaknesses this patients and 
uh, inability to lift the head, uh, neck flexion. So that if you find something like that, reduce tendon jerks. And if you've got the luxury of trying to do the full distress level uh, serially, we usually don't do that. And then you can find that some of this patient might be having intermediate syndrome. And only thing is in that case, you do that to uh, be patient. There, I think previously there was an indication of prolonging Pralloxim infusion, but I don't think anybody follows it right now. I mean, for days you go on giving Pralloxim, that is possibly not done. Uh, Dr. Prashant, uh, so when you consider these patients for uh, going for precostomy and uh, early versus late in these patients' uh, OPC findings, um, uh, so the line with the different syndromes we can uh, divide in like that. Yeah, it 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 it's uh, uh, important, but it's uh, not easy for me to uh, directly answer in one line that when do I consider early or late tracheostomy for <laughs> these patients? Because uh, most of these patients, when they are taken care, good care, good supportive care, and atropinized in uh, emergency and then shifted to ICU. They do really well, and uh, uh, by the day two to four, they are ready to be extubated. But for those patients who are lending to the intermediate uh, syndrome, uh, where there are, we obviously know that the deep tendon reflexes are going low, uh, patients can't, uh, they are developing weakness, and there are also uh, proxical muscle weakness with some cranial nerve abnormalities and respiratory insufficiencies. So these patients, once we know that from the day two, day two to day six, generally, uh, we can uh, understand that these patients have landed to intermediate uh, syndrome. And then uh, we decide for uh, their tracheostomy because then they can take up two to three weeks uh, to recover uh, fully before uh, we can uh, uh, say that they are recovered from their uh, initial symptoms which have landed them to intermediate. Dr. Prasad, you want to add something or you agree with Dr. Yeah. Prasad? Yeah, actually, uh, yes, to some extent, yes, I agree. But uh, many times I would probably go in for a early tracheostomy, particularly in the patients who have, uh, let's say we classify them as a severe category. Because uh, one thing is that we are worried about the intermediate syndrome. So uh, even if the uh, the, the patient uh, is on a, a, a TPS trial, and immediately you can put him back uh, on the ventilator. Secondly, we are worried about the secretions of this patient. And then thirdly, we are worried about the self-extubation. So there are a couple of reasons why uh, I would prefer to go in for a early tracheostomy, particularly if I am anticipating that the patient is going to stay in the ICU for longer than seven to 10 days. Even we go for the same uh, protocol, if we are able to, if the patient is going intermediate and thought uh, there is a neuropathy, that times we go for, if the patient is not coming after one week, uh, then we try to do the even nerve conduction sometimes. So, uh, Dr. Pasa, what about uh, blood plasma treating these patients, uh, things like, uh, is there any role, like uh, Dr. Balla is not there, uh, is there any role of these things, uh, therapies? Hello, Dr. Prasad? Yeah, you want me to answer that? Yeah, okay. Yes, there are two questions uh, like role of beta blockers and uh, cholinesterase, uh, replacing the cholinesterase to these patients. Because No, I think blood plasma to treat cholinesterase deficiency, it's quite debatable. I, I, we don't consider that for the standard treatment. And, and um, beta blockers for tachycardia sometimes, which is cumbersome when the patient has recovered. Beta blockers, no. So normally don't we don't need, but sometimes some of the poisoning which have more effect on the adrenal, uh, whether their patients are coming with hypertension and lot of tachycardia, they have more of uh, sympathetic. People do consider these things. Uh, what about the psychiatric consultation? Because many of patients they have uh, this problem, uh, uh, suicidal or something. Uh, it's a medical legally also important. Uh, so when we should start considering psychiatric consultation? And uh, what is your opinion on that? Dr. Bandhupadhyay and Dr. Prashant. Uh, all uh, basically positive or suicidal attempts which are admitted to my hospital, they are given a psychiatric consultation before their discharge. We try to give them once they're stable enough to communicate and uh, maybe uh, not uh, out of ICU or just going out of the ICU, uh, we call the psychiatrist and get a consultation. We insist and uh, we also 
if some patients they go back early, we feel that you have to have a psychiatric consultation. I think that's a must in a patient with a suicidal attempt. So, now I'm taking the questions from the, the thing. Uh, I'll just find out some if some question which is not answered from the chat box because we are near the time is almost over. Dr. Devti Ayer wants to say something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they are asking about the recent uh, guide, uh, recent uh, drugs which can be used. So there are magnesium sulfate, then soda bicarb, then hemofiltration, fresh frozen plasma, and hydrolysis. Uh, these are to uh, uh, remove the poison from the body or to improve the pH-induced hydrolysis of the organophosphates from the body. So these are the guidelines to add on uh, to the routine atropine, pralidoxime, and diazepam. So there is question over. Can I can I come in? Can I come in? Interim ten. Yes, please. Can I come in, sir? Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. Uh, uh, magnesium sulfate. Doubtful. Uh, we did a trial. We found that magnesium sulfate can induce at times arrhythmias in these patients, so, and it does not figure in any uh, guidelines. It says that if it has to be used, it has to be used under a trial setting. FFP is out. There are multiple studies which say, say that no FFP. Soda bicarb has only been tried in uh, Iran. Only one center where they've shown good results. In no other center, soda bicarb has shown any good uh, uh, results. Extracorporeal removal, we reviewed all the literature. We reviewed all the literature and we found that what we are probably removing is solvent and not OP at all because OP is already bound and it cannot be lipid soluble. It is highly protein bound. We did two trials on intralipid. It does not work. So if at all somebody wants to use some novel therapies, they have to be used under the trial settings with due considerations uh, uh, taken in uh, for all kinds of consents taken. So there is one question, uh, Dr. Pandupadya, atropine infusion versus intermittent doses, uh, your take on? I, I've already told them that we usually yes. use the intermittent doses initially, but if we feel that that is failing to control the poison is, I mean, uh, too much of poisoning is there. The patient last is last word, Dr. Uh, Gautam, last word, yes, Dr. Sir. Gautam, there is a study from, Sri uh, from uh, Bangladesh uh, by Dr. Faiz. People can download that, read it. They've shown that the doubling dose with infusion helps uh, and it better titrates it actually, because actually. You, can, you can actually control the side effects of atropine. So uh, we prefer using infusion because we can easily titrate it rather than yeah. intermittent use. Uh, Even we use infusion. The reason uh, being another is uh, now bottles are available and it's very easy to titrate and... Uh, uh, this thing. Even the dose probably is less if you use the infusions. So another question is uh, how to differentiate uh, OP from carbamate poisoning? Uh, Dr. Kitty, you want to answer uh, quickly because time is almost uh, getting over? In OP, the stress depression is for time being and uh, carbamate, uh, in OP it is a sustained uh, depression and in carbamate it's a transient depression. So we need to uh, manage the initially like organophosphorus, but it doesn't need any ventilator, ventilation uh, support for longer time. Mostly after 48 hours, patient comes out of their own. Sir, if I'm allowed, I just want to make one comment that uh, please, please. Farm, should, farm should not be thrown out of the bucket. Uh, it should be used judiciously in patients who come early to us. What we have seen that the dose of atropine which we are using is much less. And we have not proved and done studies, but the survival benefit on early removal of ventilator is beyond doubt. So it should not be thrown out. There are some comments which say that palm should not be used. So I think that should not be the message. Uh, we are not giving that message because it's still in the guidelines everywhere. But the only thing is the... Uh, outcome is inconsistent the reason being the timing and the compound because some of the uh, compounds lead to aging very quickly so that's why the problem is with the results so we are not taking it away 
that's not the message we want to convey. But as far as the palm considering, but atropine remains the mainstay we want to emphasize that we should not trust that much palm that we should uh, take away the atropine uh, cutting the donors. Because the target of the treatment remains uh, drying the secretion. Otherwise, uh, most of the patients, they will come up within 24 to 48 hours uh, normally. And supporting the oxygenation and the ventilation is very important. We should not think of that uh, palm and the atropine will just uh, take care of these things. It takes time. So oxygenation uh, is very important in these patients. So with that, I think uh, uh, you want to convey any message, any question, I mean, uh, uh, any other panelists want to say anything? So just last last one comment, sir, if you allow me, Dr. Tejas yes. here. Yeah, I just totally agree with Dr. Kirti Pawar that the judicial use of palm will reduce your dose of atropine because what we have seen also. So that is what my comment on the atropine and palm. Yes, I fully agree with you that we are not taking... One more I want to add that we are talking about aging again and again. These all data is from the in vitro studies and in vivo, we can regenerate the colon stress even on the 11th day, if patient again, there is a reappearance of the cholinergic crisis. And it is recommended if you need again and again multiple doses of uh, atropine, you have to start the pralidoxime on 11th day also if patient is landed up in the intermediate syndrome with cholinergic crisis. So the, whatever you are talking about aging is all about in vitro studies, but in vivo reactivity ability is having much longer period than in vitro studies. I agree with you on that point. It's not, it's supposed that's how they, because most of the compounds, there are nearly 100 compounds in the uh, pesticides, and each and every compound is different. Yeah, that's why we are talking on very little, uh, uh, yes. small evidence from the in vitro studies. And I think it's important to understand everything about organophosphorus poisoning and not to repeat again and again the prejudiced and the biased statements about the management of organophosphorus poisoning. Yes, I think the new generation could understand what is the current guidance. Yes, Dr. Kitsa, I have taken your point. Uh, the biases are always there the individually, but our message is to convey... And how long we will continue this, no? Yeah. So, Dr. Pasal want to say something. You have to unmute Dr. Pasal. No, no. I, I think uh, this, this debate about PAM is going to be there, but I think ultimately... Uh, if we have enough number of patients in the ICU and uh, particularly, hopefully you don't have enough number of patients, OPC patients, uh, then I think we, uh, it depends on your experience also. And generally we prefer to go with PAM. Yes. No, even our people are going uh, even with the late is there that we get a lot of patients. At a given time, we have four or five patients or OPC or one or two alphas. But we are facing now problem, current problem is a lot of patients are coming with the being a Punjab. We have a lot of uh, drug addiction, which is compounding the problem. Mm -hmm. Even yesterday, we had one patient, we were struggling for the last uh, 15 days to get him out, uh, dialysis and all that. We were thinking that he has taken his oral ulceration. When he got up after 15 days, he told us he has taken chitta inhaled. So that's why the ulceration was there. So this problem is going to be there, um, especially the, where we are living. We are going to, very important is uh, another aspect is uh, asking the questions from the friends and rather than the family also. I mean, the friends are giving a lot of information in these patients uh, uh, because, and mm -hmm. uh, neuropsychiatric problem we do get. So with that, we thanks to all panelists and participants for joining this national webinar on poisonings. So it's important, we should be very vigilant. We should think of it's a clinical diagnosis and atropine, oxygenation, and all these things are supportive therapies in the key. And with that, I thanks uh, to the uh, Dr. Umpa, Dr. Mishra, and the whole team that giving this opportunity. And thank you very much, uh, all participants uh, and uh, panelists, Dr. Palla. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Rungta, sir, to give the Dr. final Dr. Yes, so wind up. Dr. Rungta, please, please, sir. The man behind the uh, toxicology network, sir. Sir, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Purushottam, Dr. Uh, Prashant, Prashad, Dr. Bandopadhyay, Dr. Kirti, for an excellent discussion on OP poisoning. Uh, 
final comments. I'm not an expert on OP poisoning, but I have experience of almost 45 years. The first case that we treated was that is 1977 on a small child of three years who had consumed organophosphorus. Uh, we did not have ventilators. We did not intubate, but yet we did not lose that child. And the only drug which we had was atropine. Now, currently, uh, most of my friends know that I'm happy to, uh, and I'm uh, courageous enough to mute the principle that uh, we should have zero tolerance for mortality in OP poisoning. I have talked about it several times. I have presented papers on that. Just sharing few experiences of mine without bias and with apologies to uh, all my friends who have different opinions, opinions, difference of opinion only make us wise and uh, trigger debates and researches. Therefore, uh, you see, uh, for last 10 years, we have not used PRAM in sequential more than 70 cases, and we have not lost a single case. I'm not saying don't use PAM, but we have not used PAM. Number two, we uh, treat these patients with the principle that no dose of atropine is too high. So we have, uh, in the last case that we treated, we used almost more than 3,000 ampules of atropine. The patient walked out on day five, fifth or sixth out of the ICU. He was on ventilator for two days. Uh, we never observed toxicity of atropine. We never had to stop toxicity and uh, resort to glycopyrrolate, though we always have glycopyrrolate in our trolley. Number four, there was no opportunity ever for doing a tracheostomy in all these cases, other than one or two who were complicated with secondary infection and the long-term ventilation was required. Number five, uh, uh, we think that uh, intermediate syndrome is not related to colony stress deficiency or cholinergic crisis. It is an independent development in some patients with particular OP poisons in uh, some particularly predisposed patients. And the only treatment that we need to give them is patient ventilation. We don't use antibiotics. We don't need atropine in intermediate syndrome patients. And all of them exclusively recover uh, mostly within one week. Magnesium should be used with caution because it has got a negative chronotropic effect. It reduces uh, heart rate. And it has been a drug of choice in uh, era of 1990s against ventricular tachycardias, atrial fibrillations to reduce heart rates. So atropine, uh, this magnesium sulfate should be used with a lot of caution and at best it can be a research drug. So all in all, uh, this debate will continue with about uh, palm use. There is the word is divided. Uh, it's north versus south, or I don't know, east versus west, or a particular ICU versus ICU. I had a lot of respect for Kirti's work on PAM. I read her article first in Lancet, direct article in 2004 or five, Six. And I had a personal discussion with her also long back in 2004 or five. if she would remember when she was a very, very young girl. Now she's become uh, well, she is young, experienced, sir. experienced teacher. <laughs> sir, she is still young. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about professional maturity. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. One, one, one addition right. to this. So, no, sir, uh, I have a lot of respect for you. But one uh, word of caution I want to uh, uh, make you aware that if we, uh, somebody has not used the palm, and if patient dies, the, there was a case in our periphery 
the one uh, physician was very keen to use the atropine and not the pralidoc. No, I, I, uh, Kirti, no, no, Kirti, no, no. we are not into me. arguments. I am just concluding. No, I, no, no. I am please, also concluding. Please hold on. No, please. please don't use the palm. Don't 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 uh, conclude it. Uh, uh, I am concluding. No, no. I but said sir, I have immense respect for your work. I have said that I have not used palm for last 10 years in sequential about 70 plus cases and we have not lost a single case. And I boldly say to my colleagues and friends, I have zero tolerance for modality in OP poisoning. Now I am also muting zero tolerance for modality in AP poisoning. So, you know, AP poisoning is a different uh, ball game altogether. But Definitely not in OP poisoning. So all this, but this has been a wonderful discussion and the chapter of uh, palm use in OP poisoning remains open and uh, it will remain open for ages to come, I'm pretty sure. But there should be some people who can uh, help patients without palm or even without atropine if uh, you know they can devise some other novel therapies. So we, we should be passionate, but we should not be prejudiced. Thank you very much. And thank you all the panelists. Thank you, Toxicology Group. Thank you, attendees. Thank you, Kirti, for special appearance. We will continue to uh, discuss. We will continue to argue. when we will continue to learn and prosper. Save our patients. That's the ultimate target. Thank you. Good thank night. you, sir. Thank you all. Good night.